last episode I was making the R1 stop, so this time I'm going to make it go again. Enough boring talk about making things stop, let's make things go. This is not a genuine Yamaha fuel filter, this is a pattern one, but of equal quality to a Yamaha one and a third of the price. So this is going to sit in this hole here down here and connect the fuel pump up to the fuel tank. Then I will connect the fuel tank up to this connector here, which is just like the level gauge. And the nice thing is then, that should get rid of the last fault code on the dashboard. That's the fuel filter connected, just a case of slipping the pipes in and putting the clips on so the fuel doesn't fall out over a hot engine. Uh, I have got to double check the breather routing when I've got my workshop manual handy. But for now, that'll amount and do. I've connected up electrically, so... We can take the uh, holding device out, lower the tank down, and make sure we've got rid of the uh, fault code on the dash. This was the early days of diagnostic on dashboards. The Yamaha system was particularly simple. You turn the ignition on, and if certain things weren't connected or were faulty, the needle on the dash would point to a number, which would correspond to a fault code you'd find in the workshop manual. On these, it was, I think, 8,000 RPM was a fault with the fuel tank sender, like the fuel level light, uh, there was one for the uh, exit valve sticking and there was a third one for something else. There was only really three fault codes. So if I turn it on, the needle does not point to anything spurious, so that's a good sign. That's it, we have ignition. I suppose I probably ought to really put some fuel in it and see if it works off its own fuel supply. I have a tractor funnel with a filter in the bottom of it. It's nice and big, easy to get your fuel in your bike. I suppose I ought to really turn the fuel tap on as well. That would probably help. I'm only putting a couple of litres in for now so that if there is any problems I have to take the tank back off, it doesn't weigh 20 kilograms. That's it, the fuel pump is primed and the advantage of a clear fuel filter, I can actually see the fuel moving through it. So. Bit of choke. This is the first time it's run in, well, probably 10 years on its own fuel tank. Woo! You nearly disappeared on the floor there. So there was a bit of an oddity with the original set of clocks that when you rev the bike past about 2000 RPM, the clock would go mental and waft up and down to about 9000. So there was clearly something not very happy with it. Once I connected up the spare set of clocks, they work considerably better. So the next thing will be, will be to swap the clocks over. Changing the clocks is particularly simple. It is three little self-tapping screws in the back, one electrical connector, and here we have it. And we've lost 3,000 miles. Not that that really worries me because it'll all be on MOT history. That works considerably better because it actually works properly. And it's even got this little thing down here. When the fuel light goes on, it puts it in a trip mode so you know how long you've been running on reserve. That's kind of handy. So it's a new day in the workshop and it's time to change the fluids in the bike. The oil and the coolant that are in it are good quality, but they've been sat in it for four and a half, five years. So even though they're not really being used, they do deteriorate a little over time. So I'm going to change them. And because I'm now a Motel dealer, I'm going to be putting Motel products in it. No great surprise there. I'm also a Motel dealer because it's excellent stuff. I've been racing on it for years and it's really good quality. So I'm going to put 5100 semi-synthetic 1040 engine oil in the bike and some Moto Cool Experty stuff for the antifreeze. So that should be excellent and then the bike will be ready for many miles of happy use. While the engine's nice and cold, I'm going to change the coolant. So I've got to drain the old coolant out of this drain point. There is a copper washer on there that seals it. You should really change the copper washer. I have a tendency to use the same one a couple of times. So we'll see how that looks. So we're going to drain it all out of there, uh, drain the reservoir as well, and then put the new stuff in when it's empty. So I've drained the fluid out the bottom of the bike. 
if you take the rad cap off it flows out considerably quicker so i'm just going to undo the two bolts that hold the reservoir on turn it upside down to pour the fluid out of that and then i can actually start putting fluid back in it I tend to find it easier to fill the bike up with coolant with it on its side stand because then there's just a little bit of angle so that this is the highest point and any of the air bubbles and bits can come out of the radiator this way. So I've got it on its side stand, it's glugged and uh, a few air bubbles and bits have come out of it. I've put a little bit in the reservoir. What I'm going to do next is just run the bike for a few seconds and that will move some of the fluids around and push some of the air out of the system. already that that sort of pulled the fluid round and replaced it with a bit of air so that will need topping up so I'll just let it run for a little bit to push any more air out. So I've not run the bike for too long only about a minute or so and when I turned it off it just sucked the level down a little bit so I'm going to top it up put the rad cap on and run it up to a reasonable temperature so the thermostat's open and there's fluid everywhere that'll also make the oil nice and warm so that'll come out the bottom easier. So I've got the bike fairly warm and then let it cool a bit so I don't burn my fingers and I'm going to undo the oil drain plug and drain the oil out. I'm not changing the oil filter because the oil that's been going around it is clean so the filter will be clean inside. I'm just changing the bulk of the oil. So I'm going to put a tray underneath here, drain this out. Yamaha actually put it on the left hand side of the bike so that it drains easier on its side stand. So that's another reason you know, it's handy to have the side stand on. As much as it pains me to be pouring away nearly brand new oil, I know it's the right thing to do. It is just slightly upsetting seeing all that lovely motel stuff just pour into a bowl. <laughs> what am I going to do? Actually, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to put more oil in it. Yay! Now that that's finished draining, I can put my sump plug back in. There is a copper washer on here as well. Well, an aluminium washer in the case of Yamaha. Um, officially you are supposed to change them again I do actually tend to use them a couple of times before I change them so that can go back in and then we can put lovely new oil in it if you look in there you'll see that that bit of clutch isn't original that is an uprated clutch in there I'm not sure exactly what it is I will be finding out from Andy if he knows but that's an extra little treat anyway back to the important stuff I've got my motel I'm going to pour it into the bike and I'm going to pour it in until it's sort of pretty much at the top of the sight glass. What I've also done is I've got the bike on front and rear paddock stands so it's relatively level. Because if you're just on a rear, the bike's like that. If you're just on a front, which you never would, it'd be like that. So I'm on side stands, paddock stands even. Bike's level. I can pour the oil in until it's pretty much full, run it for a little bit and then do a sort of final level set. So you can just see the little bubble at the top, so I know the level is nearly at the top of the uh, sight glass. And what I'm going to do now is restart the bike, but there's no point in looking at the light on the dashboard, because on a Yamaha it's an oil level light, not an oil pressure light. So when I start the bike, I want to see the oil level go down within a couple of seconds. There it goes, look. That's pumping the oil all around the important bits. So I'll give that a few seconds, make sure the oil sort of circulated around everywhere, and it will circulate everywhere relatively quickly. And then I'll turn it off, give it a bit of time to resettle, check the level and set it again if necessary. So the level is looking pretty good, just in the middle there. I am going to top it up just a tiny bit so it's a little bit nearer the top line. No real need to, but why not? A bit more oil never did anybody any harm. So I'll give that a little top up and then I'm going to run it fully up to temperature and make sure everything's happy once it's settled down again. That's the bike being run up to temperature. I'm just waiting for it to all cool down now, which may in fact just be tomorrow. Uh, while it was doing it, I did have a little wipe round and just cleaned up a bit of the dust and bits off the frame and off the wheels and stuff. So the bike's coming up really nicely. The next job really is to start looking at more of the bodywork, but I would like my horn to turn up in bits before I do that because it's underneath the fairing. That's another couple of jobs ticked off in the book, and I actually do mean literally in the book, because Andy started a book for all the jobs he was doing. So that's another couple of bits done. Today I'm finishing early because I need to go and make a sticky toffee pudding, but I will be back soon to do even more on the R1.